Hi, everybody. I'm Karen Hartglass. You are listening to It's All About Food. I know I say I'm always excited when I talk to my guests, but I really mean it. I mean, I really, really mean it. I am so excited to talk to my next guest, Dr. Aitef Vita, DJ Kavum. The OG organic gardener is an eco hip hop artist, educator, and vegan chef from Denver. His songs are about climate change, food justice, and eating healthy. He's performed at the White House and has been featured in Oprah Magazine and on the Rachel Ray Show. His latest album, Biomimics, was released as a seed pack to spur listeners into action. He shared the stage with Mo Def, Nick Jonas, Rick Ross, the Wu-Tang Clan, Public Enemy, Snoop Dogg, Wyclef Jean, and many others. Dr. Atef Vita, also known as DJ Kavum, Moetivation. I don't know if I got that right, but welcome, sir, to It's All About Food. Peace and love, and you got it right. Yeah, it's motivation. It's, it looks the way it spells. <laughs> yeah, is there like a little poet in there or something in your motivation? Um, I was just literally, I, I had a friend named Mo, and uh, definitely, uh, it, we called him Motive, so it was definitely kind of like an ode to a friend of mine. Ah, yeah. sweet. Okay, I like that. You are so many things, so many <laughs> wonderful things. And I want to talk about as many as we can. Uh, you are an echo hip hop artist. In fact, I think you came up with the name echo hip hop. Yeah, eco hip hop, like environment. Oh, yeah. eco. Don't say echo. Eco. Okay. You are an eco. I want to say echo. <laughs> You're an eco hip hop artist, an educator, vegan chef. You live in Denver. You've got songs about climate change and food justice and eating healthy. I understand you've performed at the White House. You've been featured in Oprah Magazine. Okay, tell me about you, the organic gangster. <laughs> wow, OG oh, organic gardener. I'm with it though. Um, <laughs> so so much so much has been happening in my life. You know what I mean? Like from the wild wild west. You know, I grew up pretty much as a kid going to the corner store, finding nothing fresher than a lemon in the liquor store and there's some plastic grab bananas and oranges and um, wanted to create access. And so I grew up around a lot of hustlers, a lot of Gs, you know, drug dealers too, that actually helped me understand how I can transform that in my own. So, you know, elders in my community showed me how to grow food. I grew up around poetry, my mother, was a was a community activist and uh, did everything she could to keep me out of out of violence. You know what I mean? Mm. By taking me to Africa and introducing me to people like Amiri Baraka, Oscar Brown Jr., uh, as well as introducing me to tofu straight up. Had me trying that at like age ten, even though I didn't really figure it out. I went vegan around age fourteen. Nice. And um, I've been vegan for around like you know twenty something years. You know what I mean? I've lost count now, but I remember what you know. I already know how I was, you know, like I said, the community was definitely just like every food desert, food swamp, you know, you really couldn't find access because of gentrification and redlining, you know, a young African-American male who literally grew up with a youth, plant, youth penitentiary like three blocks away from my house. On the same corner was a liquor store and a crack block. So it kind of felt like it was like some weird things going on with like, you know, um, city officials and like, you know, when you talk about like who was making those uh, zoning laws available in, in the community I came from. So, you know, shout out to anybody who grew up out of Five Points Denver and made it out. You know, it was the Harlem of the West. There's a lot of things talking about, um, you know, this new Jay-Z film out right now that uh, the harder they fall. Check it out. Nat Love and a lot of those cats grew up around the corner where I'm from. Like, we have a Black American West Museum literally on the block where I'm from. <laughs> and um, I think about it from that perspective. Even the homes that I grew up were all, all Western town. It was like the edge of the mountains. Yeah, I come from a family of sharecroppers, you know, African Indians, you know what I mean? Cherokee and Sioux Nation. Um, I'm, on, I'm currently on a Arapaho Nation, like on their land, on their yeah. territory. And um, been learning a lot. As a as an activist, as a as the MC, and definitely uh, I got a lot of shoulders I stand on. So that's probably why I got so many titles. 
<laughs> you deserve them. All gravity, I think, you know. I think what I enjoy most about you is you are an artist. I'm an artist as well. I'm a singer. My partner and I do a lot of theater. And I really connect my activism with art. And one of the things I was excited about are your songs. I listened to all the ones on your website and whatever I could find on YouTube. And now it's time to download your Biomimics. Biomimics, yeah. It's like biomimicry. Right. I, I wanted to say early in 2000, around 2002, I organized a vegan food festival in Manhattan. And we did it for five years and it was tremendous. It was before the internet, really, before Facebook. Right. And uh, it was a great time. But in addition to having food and speakers, I wanted to have music and I had a stage where people performed and I wanted to sing myself. And I tried to find songs about food. I wanted to sing songs about food. I'm not a writer. And right. it was really hard to find them. I realized we need more songs about food. It's just like wow. in the 60s, with with the folk songs and singing about peace and whatever we need more songs about wow. the message so thank you well like i said you know there's a lot of shoulders i stand on you know shout out to marvin gay for dropping mercy me and right. krs1 for dropping beef and a tribe called quest for green eggs and ham and i can go down the line but like dead press drop and be healthy you know, around the same time that you probably did that festival. So it's about, you know, hip hop has always been a conduit, but the con the consistency without getting blackballed, it sometimes is hard for a lot of people who are on major labels, you know? So they try to continue to like isolate it more on like public events and they have to wait for like tragedy to really even be politically spoken for a lot of artists. And so maintaining the independence, which is really important for me, you know what I mean? To be able to actually speak my mind. And shout out to the, to the artists who are doing the same, you know, it's a lot easier to be an independent artist than ever before, um, where you can still have your music streamed and, you know, develop fans. And, but at the same time, I feel you. In 2002, I was organizing an environmental hip hop festival where we brought B-boys, MCs, DJs, and homeopathic physicians to actually talk about how to take care of yourself on tour. And, um, you know, all the way down to the ideas of like utilizing plant-based medicine to like acupuncture and Tai Chi. And so these whole concepts are important. Um, we did that all the way up until like 2009, uh, 2011, we were doing these things called Roots, Beans and Greens. It was uh, pretty much like a, a B-boy cypher that had a juicing kind of like juice to thon event. We had like a gang of, gang of juice, you know, just made people had to bring their whole, bring their own cups. And I had a gang of produce and we just like juiced all night in the five points. The old building that we actually used is now a yoga center, but it was originally mm. purchased by Frederick Douglass. And oh. that's that's how old the community is. History. You know what I mean? Yeah, there's lots of history in the five points of, of downtown Denver. It's a historic black community. It's like Harlem. And so it's like when you think about it. Um, the energy is still progressing. Of course, gentrification is happening, but there's still a lot of urban farms really popping up now. So I had an urban farm around like 2009 to around, I pretty much retired uh, from it from like around like 2015. Mm. And it's because I started to tour a lot. I was a DJ who woke up at six in the morning to go harvest my collard greens and kale and cabbage and anything else that I grew. Showed up at a farmer's market from eight to 2 p.m. Mm. and DJed on the corner at the same time selling greens. And it was, at first, it was like only three of us that turned into a market to where now we have four or five locations throughout the week. Um, shout out to Beverly Grant and the whole team that made, basically made that happen. That was called the Mo Better Home for like, not even wanting to like, you know, uh, so I wasn't like battling like the homies on the block because, you know, I'm selling, I'm selling the munchies. You know, they, they, they're not tripping on me. You know, they're like, that's not, I'm not, I'm not taking away their dollar, you know? So you think about from the, from the concept of like holistic health and adding that on to like create lucrative green job investment. It was like the beginning of the green collar economy. Not everybody wanted to, you know, do solar panels and, you know, clean up oil on the golf. Somebody, somebody just wanted to sell greens, real talk. 
And I was like, all right, cool. He come on the corner with me. I got broccoli. I got the cabbage. Holla at me. On, I'm on deck. And they would come and get it. I would have the James Brown playing in the background and they would be taking selfies. So it was the vibe of like creating this community supported agriculture without even calling the CSA. Didn't even know what I was doing. I was just like, yo, we're just going to grow on the hook. That turned into openings of other spaces where, you know, this is kind of like where I'm still dealing with post-traumatic stress a lot of uh, a lot of the times. A lot of Africans in America and indigenous people felt like it was like because of being forced to grow food, they don't want to do anything like that. It's like almost like a association with poverty. And I had to like show the fortification of the soil, the bioremediation, you know, all the things that was needed, you know, so you can get people in, into it, you know what I mean? Because you know, let's let's just be real. A lot of places in the hood got bad pipes. And so there's lead, arsenic, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of remediation that needs to happen, not even in the soil, but just the water alone. You know, right. I, I imagine trying to grow food in Flint, Michigan. You know what I'm saying? Real talk. I can't believe so, that's still you know, going on, like, that, that mess there. I yo, can't believe it's still happening. My mom lives in Detroit. She was born in Detroit. And I think about it from like what's going on there like they got why the whole state of Michigan is feeling but like let's not talk about the Navajo reservation let's not talk about like the average res across the country you know and you know there's been so much things that I try to highlight in my music and lately I've been talking about the border lately I've been talking about mig migrant workers because our food you know regardless to the pandemic you know they were still out there farming you know yep. what I mean Yep. And nobody, nobody was saying thank you like I feel like we should. At the same time, we like, you know, really not treating our migrant workers with respect, you know. So this is the way that I felt like as a, as an artist that, I, you know, not just speaking on like food justice and climate justice, but we can talk about, you know, things like social justice in a way that highlights where we're all affected, regardless of color. You know what I mean? Wow. OK, I wanted to respond to so many of the things. <laughs> You just touched on it. And let's see if I remember any of them. I love that you're all about green and you were talking about when you were on the corner and hustling all the green, the broccoli and everything. In some of your videos, a couple of them I saw, there was this big greenhouse, all white, and you were growing just tons of greens everywhere. What? Where was that? So I dropped an album called Biomimics Impacted to Seeds. And at that same time, I was a uh, kind of like a volunteer at this uh, indoor greenhouse called Altius Farms. It happens to be the largest rooftop garden in the nation right now. We got like wow. 300 tower gardens in that spot. It's going large. And um, I was in there on the harvesting team. I was like, yo, I got to shoot a video here right now. I'm working on an album, you know what I'm saying? And, um, you know, when, you, when, you, when you're in spaces like that, like it makes all the sense of the world to like continue to show people alternative forms and resources to eat compassionately. And originally I was um, one of the first urban farmers and I started this youth program called Seed the Seed at this uh, indoor greenhouse in Denver called the Grow House. That's what it, but it was spelled H-A-U-S, kind of like the German house style. And it was in a beautiful community that just really just didn't have any access. I mean, like like literally six miles to the nearest grocery store, um, minus it was like mad liquor stores everywhere, you know, like every spot, you know? And um, it was near the highway. And um, there was some, the, the developers always try to get that building, you know what I'm saying? But <laughs> we started in like 2008, 2008, we had hydroponics growing up in there. There was a, Will Allen came through and Taught, taught the, the community aquaponics. There was an outdoor garden. There was like, and we, and we literally remediated the soil literally less than four miles away from a super fun site for Suncor and a coal power plant um, that was just giving a whole hood acid rain. And the soil was like, we had to like do like a 20 by 20 plot of top soil and compost just to be able to grow outside. Wow. It was like, dang, yo, we, we we did a soil test and it was like, nah, hell to the nah. You sure can't grow in that. You're just going to kill your plants. Matter of fact, if you let anything grow, let it be mushrooms and wild spinach to do the bioremediation. We'll talk, but we let the remediation happen. And by, by like, you know, 10 years after that, we the soil was healed. The community was able to like, you know, we, we had like all kinds of stuff from like a cob kitchen in the back for the kids 
like, you know, all kinds of stuff to really continue to give back. That led into like building more access to more urban farms and greenhouses in Denver. So that was a newly built greenhouse that like right after it was built, we got it all set up. Um, I worked with some of the original people who are like kind of, you know, same, same crew work with like Stephen Ritz and who out there in the Bronx who has the, the indoor school, you know what I mean? Shout out to Bronx Green Machine. Stephen Ritz is a good friend of mine and he's teaching them kids how to grow food and I got mad love for him. He comes out to Denver a lot, shows up for the squad. I go out there and show love to him. We did a TED talk together, man. Matter of fact, we did a man head and head talk. Um, it was dope. Oh. Um, yeah. But um, yo, he had the Tower Gardens pop in there. So there was just a vibe of that. But outside the whole the whole thing, the album was called Sprout That Life. I mean, the album's called Biomimics, but the song was called Sprout That Life. And we dropped it in seeds, like these. So like fresh organic packets of seeds was how we distributed the album. You know what I mean? Because, you know, CDs is out. You know what I mean? It's just another form of plastic. We was like, yo, man, I can't even put that in my car. You know, I can't even put it in my computer right now. You know what I'm saying? So right. it's like, we're going to do something you can download. You get a recipe on the inside of the packaging. And at the same time, you can go ahead and just like, you know, put that back in the soil. It was like you're rewarding yourself for listening to music. So we gave that, we gave that out to the community, you know, and um, it was pretty interesting because I, I got it already right before the pandemic. You know, I played a couple shows with my brother Shuteska, who's uh, a young activist. I've been mentoring since he was like 10 years old. And um, he's from the Earth Guardians crew. We, we played the Mercury Lounge in New York. Then we played Montreal. Then I had a like Midwest tour with Zion and I came back to Chicago and Toronto. The last show we had was at, was in San Francisco. Matter of fact, it was not, it was in Berkeley, California on, on leap year huh. on 2020. And we got out of town before they shut that baby down. Wow. I was like, oh, literally they shut the whole, yeah, of course, everybody know they shut the country down. I was like, yeah, you got it. I had like 42,000 packets of seeds. I'm like, what do I want to do? So we started to, we literally like didn't know what to do. I came back to talk to the record label, which is plant-based records. You know, uh, I was like, we're going to do, we're going to distribute these seeds, you know, and we'll work with some nonprofits to get them out to the community. We sent them all the way out to, you know, you already know, Minneapolis. They was growing during uh, during the George Floyd riots. We have people growing in uh, ATL all the way down, of course, in Denver, of course, in Oakland, you know, just kind of spread it all out. Um, I started to partner with a crew uh, out, of, out of Minneapolis. And it was like, yo, let's do something for New York because that's the home of hip hop and it was ground zero for code. So I was like, all right, we gave back and created this uh, initiative called Plant Tega. I don't know if you know about it, but I'm like one of the co-founders with oh. the squad. Shout out to, yeah, shout out to How to Be Vegan in the Hood, my man Eric and my man Neil and Andrew. Those are all the squad. Um, I did the marketing on the end and tried recipes and we gave those all out to the community. So Plant Tega was an initiative that we set up during November, 2020 because we felt like, all right, look, this is how we can get back to hip hop history at the same time, you know, and show how plant-based lifestyles is the way that we can do it. And the reason why we chose New York because we thought about how the influence of hip hop was where we think about food related illnesses from Sean P down to Mob D, my man, you know, I can go down, you know, shout out, man, so much love, you know, big pun, guru, all these food related illnesses in hip hop you know, when you're thinking about it, like, we, we wanted to shout out you, my man Fife, you know what I mean? The funky diabetic. I was like, we got to change this, you know? <laughs> we can change this with our, with our words, with our actions, and providing a vegan chopped cheese in the middle of Brooklyn, real dope, you know? So I love it. So that was the vibe. Because you're an artist, you're creative, and you keep coming up with great ideas. Yeah, you can't stop. You can't stop. So you keep talking about access. And you've mentioned numerous times that the access in some neighborhoods to healthy food is like non-existent. You can get fast food, there are liquor stores, but you can't get healthy food. Is it intentional that these neighborhoods are set up this way? Some people say yes, some people say no. Unfortunately, it affects children because we know when children don't eat well, it affects their growth, it affects their behavior. And it, kids aren't getting the nutrition 
they need, it sets them up for more problems as they get older. And one of the things I'm excited about here in New York City, Eric Adams just won, and he's going to be our new mayor. So many people are excited about this. And he talks about this, how it's important to get kids educated early and solve their educational needs early. And that will prevent a lot of arrests and putting people in prison and all kinds of issues and getting new good nutrition. Yeah. I, we mean, can, I think we can solve like everything pretty much when we feed people properly. Yeah, man. You know, it's, it's interesting. That's really interesting you brought, brought him up. Like, I like Eric right now, I man. He, he's doing some things. You know, he, he, got, he got the attention of the people. You know what I'm saying? There's a lot of stuff. He like, like I don't know, before, before all this happened, he, like, he sent me his book, you know? Yeah. So all I've been right. With his, I've, been, I've been talking with his team, and um, I like the book, you know? I think the approach for him coming like out of law enforcement, you know what I mean? And really trying to show other ways of compassion right now. It's like, it's a really profane perspective right now that I feel like he's not really getting this credit for. So, you know, I got mad love on like his perspective on, you know, passing on the compassion around the plant-based lifestyle. I think we should see more more people and politicians like doing the same because you know the influences really does matter, obviously. Um, and the perspective of him even being a supporter of like, I've seen him, you know, go and support like the Plantega projects that we've been pushing in the hood, especially the, the, the Bushwick location. And, um, you know, my man Eric has been really working so hard over there. I got, man, the team, the Plantega team, they, they, they work really hard to make sure that like, New York is getting a lot of love and, you know, I just, I'm just happy to be a part of that right now with the squad, you know? So yeah, shout out, shout out, shout out everybody over there. You know what I mean? My man, Eric Adams, my man, Eric from the Bronx. Yeah, that's <laughs> love. <laughs> both, both Eric's. <laughs> How to be vegan in the head for real. All right. I want to talk about you as an educator and you talk to kids in schools from time to time. I started because that's how, I, that's how I kind of went through it. You know what I mean? Like, I started off, honestly, went to college for radio journalism. Did that for like 10 years. And I was like, I'm cool on all this right now because I wanted to like, you know, have a little bit more, you know, balance with the youth. And then I keep coming back to radio. You know how that is. You never really leave radio, you know? Um, but the concept of what I learned about working with the young folks is that that's, where my influence was. Like I, I left college thinking that I was gonna be on air and then I ended up getting a PhD in urban ecology and like, huh. you know, started to study agronomy. I went overseas, I studied in Uganda at the Makarewe University for urban agriculture and indigenous agriculture. And my whole goal was to learn, you know, different forms of agronomy. I, went, I wanted to be down with the trees and stuff. I taught at like three different pr primary schools while I was out there. But my whole goal was to come back and use the same knowledge. So I applied that, um, you know, I did some curriculum development for like Denver Public Schools that turned into working with the Department of Education that turned into like my album being used by like, you know, through like WIC and other departments throughout the USDA. It's just a really interesting perspective on how like, almost like in the hip hop industry, you know what I'm saying? Like I, I, kind of, I kind of became like almost like an ambassador. They had me, like the US Department of State had me flying out to like Azerbaijan to like Ooh. teach, you know, yeah, to teach environmental hip hop at like agricultural universities. And like, so I turned into like, I'm speaking in like, you know, Tuskegee and like UC Irvine and, you know, it's, this, is, this is big ag schools, you know what I mean? And so, I'm thinking about it from a perspective on how much hip hop has been a major influence that we can articulate, you know, sustainability, even in STEM, you know, like the art and agriculture part of bringing that steam into like education is like really important. So doing things like that is, um, it's kind of like a part of like what hip hop is, it's how you're in a piece helping other people. That's what it always was, you know? And well, that's I'm, the acronym. I'm thinking about, how you connect with children and teenagers. So I know in some circles, I'm very out of place when I'm talking to teenagers and they don't want to listen to anything I have to say. They see me and it's like, nah, 
<laughs> but yeah. you're but you're hip. They probably well, want. They probably love listening to you. I um, mean, yeah, I come up in there with a boom box and a blender and it's going down. You know what I'm saying? Like, That's you know, what I miss. Yeah. I missed the boom box. I brought the blender, but not the boom box. <laughs> All right, it's, it's, it's a vibe, though. It's a vibe. No, really, though. Like, if you show up, you know, the youth got man love. I know I was at, um, I was at La Cima, uh, La Cima Elementary over there in Brooklyn. And, um, I love those kids. I pull up in there every now and then when I'm in town, like just to like go and show love. Some of the teachers have requested for me to, you know, make some a couple performances in the gym and things like that for the kids. And I literally perform like a culinary concert. It's like a cooking show and a concert where, you know, I'm, I'm going live with all my, you know, my plant-based record hits, you know, and then rocking some plates for the kids, you know, showing some beautiful plating, you know. It's been fun. Uh, I really feel like this is going to be fun just because nowadays I realize that, you know, you got to reach them where they at. These kids are just learning more off of TikTok than they learn in the school. So I was like, you know, marketing needs to shift for a lot of people. You know yep. what I mean? Yep. And so that's where a lot of things is going there. I got a lot of love for people want to learn how to go vegan. So I've been teaching plant-based cooking classes called Decolonized Kitchen. It's like a recipes for resistance culinary climate action workshop. Right. So I'm, I'm actually doing one on um, on the 20th. You know, it's going to be a fun time. I'll send you more information about that. But you know what? The whole energy is really about us developing our like, you know, our understanding of like how we can be more ethical on how we purchase. So there's something that I wanted to talk to a lot of my friends about. It's like maybe vegan, but it ain't organic. And then I talked to them about like, yo, where's a, where's a traceable source? Like, is it fair trade? You know what I'm saying? Like, is it still like, is it, is it good for the soil? Is it good for you? You know what I mean? And these are the things that I like to talk about, like, what's the carbon footprint? You know what I mean? And so that whole workshop is just lacing, lacing people up with like ways that we can be more ethical on how we are like being in solidarity with how we eat. Because sometimes, you know, as a chef, people be wanting that super mad exotic and you know, see, and you know, you know the carbon footprint be like a football field, you know what I'm saying? Like, like straight up like guys still a footprint, you know what I mean? Like just to get a banana sometimes. They were like, damn, you know? And so we think about access like that and how it affects the world. You know, sometimes, sometimes I feel like the biggest thing on being an environmental activist is trying not to always get hijacked by things that people feel like they can't see, you know. I don't spend too much time trying to talk to people about climate change, but it's real easy to talk to people about pollution. It's easy right. to talk to people about the ocean being full of plastic. I'm like, cuz you don't see that? Like, you know, you ain't that blind. You know what I mean? So there's other so there's other things to like highlight around ways of being involved in the movement. And sometimes it starts with your plate, starts with how you're purchasing your food. And uh, that's what I love to work with the kids on. So this next album. It's called Concrete Garden. Um, I got Killer Priest on it from Wu Tang. I got um, Cy Rock from Rhyme Sayers. Um, yo, the whole vibe on it. Like, I got more artists on it too, but like, you know, it's about creating this unity of like artists who also feel like we need to speak truth to power about like this this food, you know, and how we're healing each other and and how we can create access with it. Because a lot of us, like I said, like if they only knew about the OSHA route and the mulling last year, half of them wouldn't have had this problem, you know what I'm saying? And that's the real talk. Right. It's just like, we, we lost the Kunindetas and the shamans. And we gotta get back to that. So. Okay, you mentioned decolonize the kitchen and I know that's one of your phrases. I, I like to say a lot to my listeners just to find your kitchen because so many people don't know where it is or don't know what to do with it but then don't once lose you, the kitchen <laughs> but once you find the kitchen decolonize it can you dig into that one that's deep wow yeah well you know what um i think last year we saw that uh with Aunt jemima um there was a perspective of openly blatant racism being on like you know kind of like minstrel show characters still on like a lot of classic pa packaging because that's how America has hit a lot of its history, even in the movie industry, going back to like, you know, the birth of a nation and things like that. 
This is my pet. Hi. <laughs> Her name is Star. Of course, she wants energy right now. Hi. Um, Hi. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, it, it was such a, it's a such a powerful term that I understand. I give mad respect to to uh, all my indigenous brothers and sisters who a lot of times refer towards decolonization through you know their their ways of staying true to their culture you know and staying true to the heritage and with that being said this is about um not just only indigeneity because you know like i said i got cherokee and sioux background on my family but um when i think about it it's more about the ethical source part the traceable source part the the part of yo straight up like <laughs> I mean, there's, there, you know, the chocolate factories, man, let's be real, you know what I mean? Like there's, I love how things happen, but sometimes where our quinoa come from is not ethically sourced, you know what I mean? Where a lot of our corn products might be genetically modified, we got to think about it, is it good for the soil, you know what I mean? And I, I'm not always pushing against the progression and the development of our food, you know what I mean? I cross pollinate my corn when I grow something different next to it, you know what I mean? And there's just easier ways to do it. And I think about communicating really where printing money, as my OG Ron Finley would say, <laughs> you know, it's really like taking it from a perspective where we can heal our soil and heal our body and learn the patience and the compassion. And that's really what it's about. It's not always about going to the grocery store. Some of us need to be the farmer's market. Some of us need to support the farmer. But we can create corner crops. We can create rooftop gardens. I live in Colorado. People grow in a closet. I'm gonna pause. I'm, I'm gonna pause on that real quick. But um, <laughs> you know, so we really can do a lot more. You know, with teaching people compassion. We love plant-based medicines. Why not include food? Just saying. Beautiful. Now, many of us are realizing, if we didn't realize it before that the United States of America was built or gained its wealth and capital on the backs of exploited people, the slaves who had the knowledge and the talent in agriculture and built up the South and so much more. And capitalism and exploitation continue. And I have this concern in the vegan movement that capitalists are taking over our plant-based movement, our movement to want to get healthy food that is free of cruelty, free of exploitation to the people. And now we're seeing more money, more investors interested in us <laughs> or exploiting us with all these crazy new products cell-based meats, cultivated meats, whatever they want to call them. Mm. And I just wanted to hear your thoughts on some of that. Hey, man, it's all good. I'm waiting on these indigo children. I ain't worried about nothing. You know what I'm saying? These, these kids is lit. Lord, I ain't even, all, all they need is just like, just to learn something about what they shouldn't do. You know what I mean? This cancel culture, yeah, I ain't afraid of them, but I know that they ain't taking no, they ain't taking nothing. That's for sure. You know what I mean? So the energy about it, yeah. Uh, uh, the, it's, it's balancing out. I'm gonna tell you like that. You know what I mean? As a guy, I can see the feminine energy and the principle of the earth being recognized. I see billionaires buying up land to preserve it. I see a lot of people who got a gang of money doing dope stuff. Mm -hmm. And I wanna give them mad credit. Matter of fact, I hope that, you know, people who got knowledge of self and got, got a good sense and a good heart become mad rich. You know what I'm saying? So they can do something positive with it. You know what I mean? I'm trying to do like the do like the CEO of Patagonia and go ahead and pop up like the half of the rainforest so I can give it back to the people. Real talk. You know what I'm saying? Like I see cats like that. You know what I mean? And that's 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 dope. You know what I mean? Some of them are selfish because you know that maybe that was their personal dream since they probably, you know, when they first got their money, it's like, man, I just want to do this. You know, maybe Jeff Bowes is like, I want to be in a rocket when he was a kid. He lived his dream. He was so happy. He got off the, off the joint and gave somebody $200,000. $200, he was like, yo, homie was happy. I respect when people feel a charity like that. But at the same time, you know, there's so much abundance. You know, I know our earth is abundant. 
I know that our resources are abundant. If we think in the manifest and the, and the word sound power scarcity, yeah, we're going to get that. Real talk. You know what I mean? And that goes for anything that we want to manifest. You know what I'm saying? You know, but at the same time, for a lot of parents, anybody talking to doomsday over here, they ain't talking the end of the world at all. You know what I mean? Especially for the ones who got kids. So it's like you think about it from a perspective of like longevity and, you know, success. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, like I said, like, you know, I hope somebody who's sitting on like, you know, a couple stacks, a couple yards, you know what I mean? Want to go ahead and go cop up some, some mineral rights and buy back the water from Nesty. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm right? saying? Go help the community. You yes. know what I mean? Do something different. It's, it really is important, you know, about um, about people knowing ways that they can use their money for for knowledge itself and for health for the planet, and you know, not even worry about it being capital. You know, the, you know, the money's gonna change eventually. It used to be cowrie shells and gold. Now we're talking Federal Reserve notes. Now they're talking crypto, whatever. Let them come up with the Amero after they drop the, you know, the Euro, whatever they want to do. I'm, I'm, hey, regardless, we still gonna be bartering my corn for some cabbage. <laughs> All right, you mentioned children, and you have three daughters. Mm -hmm. I got three girls. Yeah, you got, and you delivered home. them. Yeah, all on full moons. Yeah, I you remember know? reading in Brother Vegan your interview with Breeze Harper that you studied midwifery, and yeah. I when I thought about it, I thought we are really brainwashed and programmed to think some wild things. So women in this country, especially since, I don't know, the 50s and later, we were made to believe that a doctor had to deliver our children in a very awkward situation that was easier for the doctor and not for the woman. And most of those doctors were men. But when it comes to being a midwife, we're like, a man as a midwife? That doesn't make any sense. So we're, we're, we want to have the doctor as a man, but to deliver the baby, but a man shouldn't be mid. We've just got some really strange programming. Yeah, it's definitely different out there. I feel you. They, you know, on the block, they call me Mr. Midwife, the Daddy Doula. You know what I'm saying? Um, um, I got like five on my belt. You know, I don't be going around the block. So, but hey, homie, you need to deliver your baby, play. You know, holla. You know? That's kind of you know. Some homies on the block, they're like, man, nah, nah, nah. I got this. You know, I got. <laughs> <laughs> and at the end of the day, um, I think that's a beautiful thing too. Uh, I, I, I remember catching a call in the middle of the night, you know, a friend of mine, Philadelphia, you know, I was like, bro, I just get you two pairs, you know, of some real good shoestrings, you know what I'm saying? And really, you don't have to catch this one, bro. You know, you don't need, you know, and it was a really beautiful thing, like, as far as like trying to describe emergency situations for, for family and friends like that <laughs> you know what I mean? you know like you know I, I used to like always push and promote it was just like friends and family who knew who I was it was like right I want to do this at home in, in the bathroom all my children were born in water beautiful lotus birth you know what I'm saying born to music each child you know what I mean like first first born came to Bob Marley you know my second born was born to Fela Kuti and my, my youngest, she was born to the sound of Buddhist monks. And this is, you know, I call her mm. my Dalai Mama. <laughs> yeah, she cool. I, um, all, all my children have original, you know, Nigerian uh, names and at the same time, you know, embody like, you know, where, where I'm from here, you know, in the, in the Americas, but I made sure to give them one from the continent, you know what I mean? Even though they was born in the heart of the five points, in the bathtub, you know what I mean? And um, knowing how that culture is, you know, it's important. You know, my grandfather uh, was born on the plantation, child of 17, and you know, was a part of the great migration from Arkansas to Detroit. And thinking about like, you know, all the history, the Motown, the energy, like, of course the music would have been there, but yeah, you know, just being a part of that culture of like, you know, farmers, you know, going to the big city, you know, I think I, I felt it was already a part of the green thumb, you know, kind of knowing how to just keep you coming, you know what I'm saying? Real talk. Our society has taught us to forget 
so many essential things in life, like growing food and delivering our children. And everybody right. should do these things or a lot of people because they're essential. And when we have a crisis like a pandemic, it all comes down to the essential things. And on, I thought we were going, I thought we were learning something last year in 2020. And oh, we're quickly forgetting what's really essential. Not everybody, but a lot of us. Hey man, I know Ron Finley's masterclass is like number one right now. For yeah, everybody. he's awesome. Oh, and that's I said, good. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm excited. You know what? But that's, that's the thing. There's like 85% of the vegans in America are like people of color, you know? So there's been a lot of impact and it's not just because, you know, the black toast intolerant. That's, that's a real thing. You know, it's just that we just don't process dairy the same way. You know what I mean? Kind of like, you know, the same way, like, I guess, light res resuscitation for anyone else. You know what I mean? But thinking about it from a perspective of like, like the health and wellness the access is coming in. I'm I'm super. I'm, I'm slapping on. You know, I can throw a rock and find a veggie burger. Everybody in their mama got oat milk. I'm like, oh yeah, pull <laughs> up. You know what I'm saying? I'm pulling up now. You know what I mean? Back in the day, come on. You know, for us veteran vegans, oh yeah, this is like I'm I'm trying everything. You know what I mean? I'm out here like, let me try that. Let me try that. I gotta have an opinion. You know, and then certain stuff, I'm like, you know what, mm -mm, I, I can't do that. You know, it tastes, it tastes too familiar. I don't want to go back to that. You know what I mean? I'll be right. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> so you got to have fun with it, though. You know what I mean? Like, you know, it's kind of like how old school hip hop needs to have love for, for the new school. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not out here dissing these kids. I love what they're doing. I think that they just need a little bit more diversity. They're super headstrong. You know what I mean? They, you know, they got all the pronouns in the world. I'm, I'm just trying to be hip hop. You know what I'm saying? Like y'all do what y'all want to do. You know what I mean? Whatever, you know, you know, I support you. You know, all these kids just trying to yeah. be different because we yeah. were trying to be different too. When hip hop just came out, we were trying to wear our hat backwards and sag our pants on purpose, you know? Sure. And we, we were just trying to, trying to be different. And now I feel that they're in the same space and they really do need our support. Yo, we need to create intergenerational dialogue. I hope all the, all the OGs out there who take their time, you know, to to work with these babies, you do, you know, because right right now, man, that ain't nothing better than watching the leaves fall down to the oldest part of the tree, but they also create warmth, and that's that's kind of that same that same energy that we need that you know that intergenerational dialogue minus the intergenerational tyranny, because you already know I know some old heads, you know, they they ain't trying to recycle, you know, and they're not trying to. <laughs> give up their gas guzzling car. And I'm like, look, man, there's ways that we can help out and uh, just maybe show up to the farmer's market. So, you know, we, we, we doing the work. I appreciate you, you know, taking your time out on this too. You know, my cat is like falling asleep in my lap right now. It's like, <laughs> it's like, I'm not leaving. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I got another question. What about, tell me about the Vita Earth Foundation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the Vita Earth Foundation was founded by Alchemia Earth and myself. We were in a beautiful time of like giving back to community. And uh, one of the one of the first things that we did was pick up where I left off in around like 2014 for this Keep It Fresh Day. So we did the annual Keep It Fresh Day, which is like we, we got a day like a proclaimed proclamation in Denver for environmental hip hop, you know what I mean? And it's called Keep It Fresh Day on June 14th. It's around Juneteenth because it's oh, around like nice. the liberation and yeah, like the liberation of the mind, it's dope. So the mayor hooked that up for the organization and we've been doing these uh, beautiful community events. I encourage people to go plant-based. So we have like, of course, vendors and film and performances and, you know, kind of have like this engagement with uh with the community you know and uh that's a beautiful thing so we've been rocking stuff like that uh last year we gave out hundreds of thousands of seats um you know just you know literally it was so much fun um just to be able to like help communities in need and uh that's that's kind of what the vibe has been outside of like you know rocking in the schools doing you know, doing like lectures and things like that for the youth, you know, but um, for more people are interested, of course, they can find out like, you know, be the earth fund dot org, be the earth fund dot org and uh, check us out.
Okay, what I loved about the website is the picture of you and your wife, Alchemia, as the American Gothic. Ah, that's a classic, right? Yeah. And it's uh, a great thing. And, and then I was like, I was sitting with it for a minute and being familiar with the, the original painting by Grant Wood, the American Gothic, my understanding is that his intention was to be a positive statement about farming and rural American values in a time of great dislocation and disillusionment. And, yeah, yeah. and I see that with your image as well, a positive statement mm -hmm. in a time of great dislocation and disillusionment. Wow, interesting. It was a great choice. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> wow. Shout out to, you know, New York's own Justin Boer, who uh, painted that, you know, nice. hip hop historian. Um, he's a vegan friend of mine. Uh, he told me, uh, matter of fact, you know, he told me he tried to get uh, MC Light to go vegan back in the early 90s. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like a vegan chocolate bar, but he's like one of my favorite painters of all time. Mm. And um, it was honor just, you know, the homie did a portrait, you know what I mean? To, and immortalize us, you know, in a way, you know what I mean? During a time like that, yeah, shout out to Bua. Where, uh, this, is, this has been a fun time with you, you know? Get a chance yeah. to learn a little bit about you, you know? We have similar favorite colors and all that jazz, you know? <laughs> okay, one last thing. Tell me some of the things that you like to eat and what your daughters like to eat. Wow. My daughters love ramen. They will eat it in any time of way. <laughs> Um, me, I love raw cheesecakes. I love raw food. My homie Matthew Kenny is one of my best friends. My one of my mentors is Brian Terry. Uh, I'm, I'm oh, yeah. either raiding his. I'm either raiding his kitchen when I'm in Oakland, or <laughs> I'm like literally, you know, slapping down like some, you know, deconstructed over at Plant Food and Wine by the homie Matthew. So it's like. It's really, I, I, I like home cooked, beautiful, you know, classic you know, vegan meals, you know what I mean? Straight up out, straight out the kitchen, like, you know, at the home Brian's house. But on the real, I like to sit back. Like, I'm, I'm a chef who likes my, you know, it's like iron sharpens iron. You know what I mean? Like, I'm a, I'm a raw food chef too, but I need to go and sit down on places where I can just be really be inspired. You know what I mean? Like, you know, I feel like going to like Matthew's restaurant makes me feel like I'm at a Roy Ayers concert. I'm like, man, this is amazing. This is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> every every time, you know, every time, you know, it never gets old. And that's what I mean. It's like, you know, um, I really do appreciate my friends. Like, man, like being fed is better than sometimes me always being in the kitchen. You know what I'm saying? And so, and and I realize that like I'm a chef who loves to cook, but then I love to eat more than I love to cook. And let's be real. Oh, you like to be you like to be served you like to be served and enjoy good food right 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 have, we all and not Don't have to do all. the dishes afterwards yeah Straight that's up, a nice you know, treat I, I know i've been rocking that vegetable kingdom book by brian terry you have me lit i've been I, I love going through recipes of uh you know the ones who inspire me too you know what i'm saying so yeah man i'm gonna let you go just uh what what have we not talked about that we need to know about about you so much cool stuff um I write so I mean, much cool stuff <laughs> well like I said you know um I have I got these seeds I'm pushing that's the most important important part I want people to grow food and you know the more access that we can create in our community that's all I'm on right now you know what I mean so you know hopefully they'll, they'll see what's up you know my latest music video I dropped is called pull up on the gate it is a tribute towards migrant workers and urban farmers. My first green job was cutting grass. <laughs> you know what I mean? Wow. And planting begonias, you know? And I didn't think it was a green job. I was just working, you know? And it didn't feel good doing that in affluent communities sometimes. Yep. Yep. So I did a song about it. And it's called Pull Up on the Gate. I premiered it on. Shay for five with my man Sway, you know, talk to Ice T over the air about why we should grow food in the hood. Um, definitely check out that. It's been a it's been a vibe to understand what we can do in our community, you know, when it comes to um, utilizing 
our resources to talk about food justice, sustainability, holistic health, culinary climate action, because you know a lot of us don't really have access. I was um, I was the tour DJ for Zion I for about five years. And sometimes we don't understand what's going on, but we recently lost our brother mm. on August 13th. I was playing Black Veg Fest that day and I had to fly out to New York. And um, when that happened, I was in Oakland. So it's like this year has been, it's been really, really odd. Like, you know, losing friends, you know what I mean? I'm sorry. And um, that's why our energy has to be protected. You know, we have to protect it with the food we eat, you know, the frequencies we, we carry and that compassion is important, you know what I mean? And so when we start to work with, you know, the earth, you know, we're working with ancestors, you know, mm. as a DJ, all the turntables, all my records are made from fossil fuels. Yep. That means that I'm playing the dead in a form of way. And not the Grateful and, Dead. You're playing the real dead. Literally, I'm playing the matter, the the the, the tree matter, the everything that that fossil fuels are made of. And so we are communicating with the ancestors when, as a DJ. And so I mm. feel like, you know, when we use hip hop, it should be shamanic. It should be sacred. And sometimes it's being used for, you know, sex, drugs, and violence. You know, to to feed the deaf, dumb, and blind. And, and we can do something righteous with it. And it takes time for us to be able to acknowledge the ones that are because there is spritz in the moment with people spraying out light. The consistency is what we have to manifest and conjure for all of us because some of us all get damp but we all need to dry out. And it takes a fan from somebody's flame who's a lover of your style, right? Or somebody who just wants to fan your flame, real talk. And so, we got to think about it um, from a perspective of how we can give back. And the best way to give back is to feed the community. And you want to give them something that's not going to, you know, create a compromise for the future, you know? And that's why plant-based lifestyle is important because these kids are really, they're going to keep ditching school and walking on the block with Greta and anybody else who wants to fight against the injustice of the world. And if we don't listen to them as elders, we're going to lose them. So we got to really work with the heart and the soil and not just um, not just with the emotion of the water. And we all we all in our head and we really need to get grounded Mm. because some of us lost our way and we're not using the sage and the cedar and we're not using the mullein and the ocean root that is literally there for us to heal our space and our lungs. And we're not we're not talking about the resources that are there and we're missing out on the healing but outside of that hip-hop can change that but if we just put it in a rhyme like that wow you just wrapped it up so beautifully Whew. all right thank you this was this was really fun for me all right That's thank you done. i'm gonna let you go now and i'm gonna keep listening Dr. Itaf Vida, DJ Kava, motivation. I hope everybody is motivated by this conversation. I know I am. Blessings, uh, grateful, gratitude. Thank you. Respect. Peace. That was Dr. Itaf Vita, also known as DJ Kava, motivation. And I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. I will post links at the bottom of the page so you can. Find out more about DJ Kavim and all of the amazing projects he is involved with. I recommend downloading his newest album, Biomimics, and you can get your seed packet too. While we're on the subject of hip-hop, I wanted to bring to your attention that this week, starting November 11th, for seven days, the makers of the film They're Trying to Kill Us will be promoting the film and you'll be able to download it for seven days only on their website, they're trying to kill us.com. You may be familiar already with this new film, but as it is described, they say it blows the lid off the institutional racism, which has led to abhorrent rates of diabetes, cancer, 
and other chronic diseases among Americans of color. This is a new groundbreaking documentary from the executive producer, seven-time NBA All-Star Chris Paul, and seven-times Grammy winner Billie Eilish. And the film features notable influencers from the fields of hip-hop, medicine, sports, entertainment, policy, and politics, all weighing in on the singular most daily threat to American society that mainstream media doesn't want to talk about it. We talk about it here on It's All About Food all the time on the website www.theyretryingtokillus.com, it says, They're Trying to Kill Us is the follow-up feature-length documentary to the award-winning film, What the Hell? Focusing on food, injustice, told through the lens of hip-hop and urban culture. Produced by Keegan Kuhn of Cowspiracy and What the Hell? And John Lewis, badass vegan, vegan smart. Hip-hop influences global culture more than any other art form in human history. What hip-hop artists say, wear, drive, drink, and eat influences the purchases of millions of people around the world. As more and more influential hip-hop artists adopt a food-conscious lifestyle, it has the potential to radically shift the world they speak to. Their global influence has a real possibility of combating chronic disease, minimizing climate change, reducing health care costs, ending starvation, and promoting compassion. The aim of the film is to encourage critical thought about justice by highlighting hip-hop artists and activists who speak about injustice in all its forms. The film addresses food access and food deserts, nutritional and environmental racism, diet-related diseases, racial disparities of disease, government corruption, animal cruelty, climate change, and ultimately how the influence of hip-hop will save the world. Well, that is one delicious mouthful, and I cannot wait to see the film. Hope you are there watching it, too. Get your dry air popcorn popped. Sit back and watch. That's all for today, folks. Thanks so much for joining me. I hope you have enjoyed the program. You can find me at responsibleeatingandliving.com. Share your comments and questions. Sending me an email at info at realmeals.org. Everybody, have a delicious week. 